Anyway, I finished philosophy. My first uh, uh, job was a stock market trader. I was working in an investment company. We were five people. We had a $350 million portfolio. I resigned in two months. I was uh, doing trades up to $8 million per day. I didn't sleep much. I didn't do anything else than that. I looked at my boss, who's been doing it for 50 years, and I said, do I want to look like that? The answer for me was no, even if I have a portfolio like he does. The answer is still no, and I resigned. And I went back to uh, university. I was accepted to one school of economics. I decided labels are meaningless. 50 grand for a year is not worth it for me. I'm going to New York. I went to New York instead. Um, I did international relations, and my specialty was armed war conflict. Uh, armed conflict. And I was looking for my thesis, I was looking for something cutting edge, something interesting, something uh, unique to do, something which hasn't been done before, something in which I could make a contribution. That was about 2004, 2005, just as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were starting. And I said, look, and I've always been having this fascination for technology. This is the first time when machines are in charge of human lives. lives. The first time we saw, and in the beginning they started with a couple of dozen predators and reapers and things like that. But this is the first time in our history when machines decide, by operator for now, eventually that part of the process will be automated too, whether a human being would live or die. So I said, okay, let me look at artificial intelligence in times of war. Let me look at robots killing people. Let me look at how this is impacting us now how it's going to impact us a few years ago. I just rode this summer in the good old robot car. That car has done 200,000 miles, it has been in two accidents, once when an engineer was driving it on human mold and made a mistake and hit a pole or something like that, the other time when it, time when it was rear-ended by a guy on a red light in the back. So the car, the actual artificial intelligence is smarter and safer than any of you here is and better. And that's the future. Anyway, so um, I graduated. Um, at the peak of the recession, I sent 200 resumes. I have all kinds of international awards, accomplishments, scholarships. I didn't have a single um, reply. And I stopped counting up to 200 resumes. One of the resumes I sent out was to a blog by the way, fantastic blog, the best blog in the Singularity niche, it's called singularityhub.com. Fantastic blog, now I know the guy who started it, his name is Steve Weiner, and he's a former Google guy, fantastic guy. So I sent an application for that to that guy to get me as a freelance writer. He never replied. And I was like, darn it, what do I do now? And then I was like, you know what, I can actually do this. I can actually make a blog and do what this guy does. Maybe I'm not going to be as good as him because clearly he, you know, retired from Google, he, he got some stock options, he had a big push behind him, he knew a lot of people, he was in the middle of Silicon Valley. So I was losing every step of the way compared to him, you know, in terms of competition. But I was like, you know what, maybe I can try doing it. And you know, I, I took about a month and a half before I actually produced my first web page, and Tony here, who is uh, a systems administrator at UFT remembers perhaps the first page, and it was abysmal. It was just horrific. It was shameful. It was just terrible. I'm ashamed of it, but it got me where I am today, and that's something that you guys shouldn't lose. And so I started blogging, uh, and bit by bit, I got to be better. And I'll tell you some of the secrets that, that I've discovered, and some of the secrets that served me well. One of the reasons why I, that I started podcasting is this. If you can't market yourself well, get others to market you for free. The biggest and best people in your industry can market you for free. How is that possible? Well, here's how I did it. I get to, to interview people. I've interviewed some super famous people in a specific field. People such as Aubrey de Grey, who is the head of the Sense Foundation. People like uh, Peter Diamandis. People such as Dan Barry, who had the, held the record for um, uh, the longest spacewalk, and twice he's been uh, in space. Uh, people such as, by the way, James Martin, the guy who donated, the largest ever donor in the history of Oxford University, gave them $150 million 
started the James Martin School of Future Study, lives on his own private life island in the Bahamas. You know, uh, people of that sort, Kevin Warwick, the first cyborg, the guy who connected his nervous <coughs> system to the internet 20 years ago and across the Atlantic communicated telegraphically to his wife's nervous system, right? And what happens is this, I interview them on Skype, I record it, I take off the audio, audio, I put it on iTunes, I take off the video, I put it on YouTube, and hopefully I did a good job, so preparation is a key. If those people like your interview, right, because let's face it, if we're honest, the pe people's favorite topics are their work and themselves, right? People love talking about themselves and what they do. Case in point, right? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Thank you. <laughs> I can't argue with that. So, so if they like what you do, what they end up doing is they end up tweeting and social bookmarking and emailing and telling their people about your interview. And in this way, you get those famous people to actually push your blog, your website, and your work. And so I ended up interviewing Aubrey de Grey. And if you know anything about longevity and life extension technology, he's in every documentary on that topic, every Discovery Channel. He's running the Sense Foundation, who's got just a recent big grant from Peter Thiel, who's the founder of PayPal. He's connected. He's amazing. His interview had me 50,000 downloads in three months, just like this, 50,000 downloads. And it, it does get easier. It's very hard to get the first two interviews, but once you start going, then you start telling people, you know, I have 100,000 unique visitors per month. So I send an email to somebody and I say, um, greetings, my name is Socrates. Uh, I am the blogger uh, behind singularityweblog.com. I have 100,000 unique visitors per month. And I have interviewed people in your field, such as uh, Stephen Wolfram, uh, who is the, the guy who created the API behind uh, Siri in iPhone, and Wolfram Alpha guy. Over the great Richie Diamandis, I just missed was I was just like this because his body passed away and we had to cancel everything, but we'll do that again. And and when you tell people all those things, I offer a big audience, I offer all those people in your field who know where your colleagues and people who you respect have already done interviews with me. Most people if they can do it, because most people are actually nice people if they've accomplished anything, you guys find they're amazingly nice and generous people with their time, they're willing to come and do it for you. And so this is what I did. And and so um, basically um, my second year my, the idea is how do you blog and podcast to, to to survive, right? Because if you're not making money as I haven't been and I still am not really uh, it's very hard to survive. It's it's almost impossible, right? So uh, there are several ways you can monetize indirectly what you do. And I found for me last year was this. Singularity University, which is located in NASA's campus in Ames, California, in Mountain View, cost $30,000 to be there for 10 weeks. It's sponsored by Google, by Nokia, by the Kaufman Foundation, by, by Alphabet, who makes the 3D software. NASA provides the location, the buildings. It's incredible. You're in the middle of the kitchen of the future of technology. It's absolutely unbelievable. So my strategy was like, okay, how do I go there for free? And that's like getting paid for my work, right? Because it's 30 grand, which I didn't have. And then I said, okay, well, I applied twice, and twice they turned me down, right? So what can I change in my application now that I didn't have before so that I can improve my chances. I'm talking to some pretty amazing people in the world. Why don't I get to find the most incredible people who carry weight in that environment, interview them, and then if they like what I did in our conversation, ask them for letters of reference. Now, how hard is that, right? It's not easy, but it's not impossible. And once you do it, it works. And so I... I was lucky to interview James Martin that I told you about. Um, he's actually the only living person who has 105 published textbooks on computer science. Google him up. Incredible guy. He's written 110 published books. Okay, He's unbelievable, that guy. Unbelievable. So he wrote my, one of my letter of reference, letters of reference. Uh, Already Greg was another guy who is, by the way, on the faculty of Singularity University doesn't hurt. 
Kevin Warwick, the first cyborg, wrote another one of my letters of reference. It doesn't hurt, right? So what happened was I was put on the waiting list. And uh, I didn't know which way the way things are going to turn out until the very last moment. And 36 hours before the beginning of the program, I was called and I was told, you're accepted on a full scholarship. Come here, all you need to do is take your toothbrush and your toothpaste and you're set, right? I was, and, and just to give you an example of the power of social networking and the power of community, right? I was so excited, but I didn't even have money for a plane ticket. Right? So I just tweeted. I just said, wow, I can't believe it. I made it in. I'm going in on a full scholarship. Wow. And 15 minutes later, one guys, one of my guys, one of my followers sends me an email and says, you're incredible. You deserve it. I want to buy your plane ticket. I'm like, really? Are you serious? He's like, you deserve it. I'm going to buy your plane ticket. And I was like, well, that's the power of a tweet. Of course, that's not just the power of the tweet, that's the fact that I've been doing, giving out in the community before that for, for at least two and a half years without ever monetizing and without ever asking for a favor. So, um, so I ended up going there. I have to tell you, it's the most incredible place in the world as far as I'm concerned. You meet the most incredible people, people who would never say something is impossible because they've heard it all their life and, and they've done it anyway, right? So Peter Diamandis' childhood dream is to be an asteroid miner. And he will be an asteroid miner one day. Uh, he's the guy who sends people in space right now and charges them a nice fee of like $30 million a pop or something.